think we've got pretty much everyone. So uh, welcome to the Georgia and Fayette Center for Healthcare Innovation, our 2022-23 Patient Engagement Lunchtime Learning Series. For this session, uh, we'll be learning about engaging children and youth in health research work. Um, I'm just going to start us off with a few housekeeping items, and then I'll turn it over to our speakers. So uh, there will be time for discussion at the end, but feel free to ask questions in the chat or make comments. Um, if you want to use the chat box, you can click the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Enter your text where it says type message here. You can send messages to everyone in the meeting or to specific people such as myself uh, using the drop down box above where you type your message. If you have any trouble with Zoom, uh, please feel free to message me directly at any time and I'll help you out. We do have uh, auto transcription enabled or we are about to. There we go. And so you can toggle those on or off. Um, using the captions or subtitles bottom, button at the bottom of your screen. This series is accredited by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada as a group learning activity. It may also be eligible for credits towards requirements of other professional bodies, such as the College of Pharmacists of Manitoba and the College of Registered Nurses of Manitoba. <clears throat> If you'd like to receive credit for your attendance, just make sure that your full name is shown so you can rename yourself uh, by right clicking on where your video is or where it would be and selecting rename. You can also click the participants button at the bottom of your screen, find your name, hover over it and select more and there you'll also have the option to rename yourself. And we will be sharing a link to the recording on YouTube uh, with everyone who registered so um, no worries about uh, taking notes or whatnot. Um, I think perhaps Carrie will also be able to share the slides with us, which would be fantastic. I think that's everything for housekeeping, so I'm going to turn it over to Christabel and Carrie to introduce themselves. Christabel, why don't you get us started? Hello, everyone. My name is Christabel. I am a second year student at the University of Manitoba. I am a patient partner with the ProKid Research and also with RACI and other research. I'll pass it on to Carrie to introduce herself as well. Hello, my name is Carrie Costello. I'm the patient engagement coordinator at CRIM and also have worked as a patient, as a parent partner mostly um, on about 12 different research, research projects. So we did want to start off today with a land acknowledgement. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining today from Treaty 1 territory on ancestral lands, the traditional territories of the Anishinaabeg, Ininuak, Ithinuak, Denusalin, Anishinuak, Inui, Dakota, and Dakota peoples, and on the homeland of the Red River Metis. As a white person who has come to this land by choice, I acknowledge that I have privilege based on the color of my skin. I appreciate all the custodians of this beautiful land, both past and present, where I live, work, and raise my family. I do want to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and that these harms continue to the present day. I do hope to move forward in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration in my work, in my community, and in my life, and I am always learning. So I do welcome feedback on my words and my work at any time. So we, uh, myself and Christabel, both of us do work at the Children's Hospital Research Institute of Manitoba. Christabel works on our RACI, which is our Research Advisory Council for Youth, um, as well as other projects. And we both work on various research projects as patient partners. Sometimes there's compensation for that work, sometimes not. Um, there are the objectives on the screen. Um, if you wish to see them, but we'll move quickly past them. And I think we'll get on to the why. So this is Chloe, and she's just talking about why it's important. I'm a youth with a chronic health condition. Um, when I was three years old, I was diagnosed with juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So I've kind of been involved with the Children's Hospital for quite a number of years. It's so important to involve youth in research. Um, and personally, I've really seen the positive impacts of involving us. Um, when I was young, when I did those questionnaires, sometimes they would be a little bit confusing and you could really tell that um, they hadn't really gotten any patient input into it because if I read the questionnaire one way, I would fill in a five, but if I read it in a completely different way, it would be a one or two. And there was nothing really to help me um, distinguish between which way I should read it and it was just really hard so I think that involving youth even for small things like that can just help to um, 
make research more clear and um, make it more fitting for the patients themselves and for the youth themselves. So that question that Chloe was talking about probably did not collect a lot of valid data or good data. And really, it's really thinking about it as a whole. We had another student researcher who came to our group and they were proposing uh, questions. It was with uh, questions that would be about transition from youth to adult care. So it was for youth. And one of the youth in the race, he said, I can't answer any one of these questions. And it wasn't because of the language or any of the usual things you think of. It's because they all started from the assumption that the youth was already interested in and starting to take over their own health care. All of the questions were framed from that lens, meaning a kid who hadn't started the process or really hadn't even thought about that had really nothing they could offer. So a slight tweak in the ordering and asking a question up front if they had started this process or not, and then having sort of alternative questions that framed it as how would you want this to happen was all that was needed to fix it. But the researcher hadn't considered that. Okay, we're going to change screens for a minute. Christabel, I'll pass it back over to you. So we're just going to do a little bit of activity. Um, go to Mentimeter, use the code, and put on your tongue. What do you think is hardest in engaging in, um, children and youth? I'll give you two minutes to do it, and we can go through some of the points. So I've popped the link to Menti in the chat. You can go there and enter that code, or you can use the QR code and your camera, um, your phone camera on the screen to get the link. All right, I think go ahead, Christabel. Yeah. Got... Okay, so thank you all for your suggestions. Um, so we're gonna be talking about all these in our slides. So for example, um, purpose, the research has to be purposeful to the youth. That you have to build trust, give them compensation, ethics requirements. So we all, we'll go through all this in our um, PowerPoint. Um, so we'll go on to the next um, slide. All right, there we go. Uh, so just a note, this video will be a bit quiet at the beginning, but it will get a bit louder. And uh, so this is Emma and she's gonna tell us what not to do. Hello, my name is Emma and I'm 13 years old. I've been involved as both a participant and partner in research. Uh, I've been a partner for one project where I felt I was not being heard. Uh, there were four youth and two parent partners. And I felt that the parent partner's opinions valued more than mine or the other youth. Um, and I felt like the researchers did not care much about what we thought. So in summary, just make sure that the youth and children are feeling that what they are contributing to the research is valuable. Don't make them feel undervalued. Make sure that their information is being heard. I'll move on to the next point. I'll pass on to Karen. Yeah, perfect. So I'll talk a little bit about the prep work beforehand, and then we'll get back into sort of at a meeting and things like that. So the first thing is you do need the right equipment. You know, if you're digging a garden, you need a shovel. In this case, I highly, highly recommend a cell phone. Um, when I started this job, and I knew that youth was going to be a part of it, I asked them, don't give me a desk phone that will not help me please, please give me a cell phone. Christabel is actually one of the few youth who, youth who actually checks her email. Most of them I have to text to say, I sent you an email that I need you to respond to if ever I need an email back. And they want reminders, usually quite a few. I have one youth who shared, you cannot possibly send me too many reminders. And I will admit, I have woken up a few youth at five minutes after noon when our meeting started at noon on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, Sundays tend to be the best time 
to engage youth. Why? I am not sure, but that so far has been every youth meeting I've ever scheduled is almost always on a Sunday. Sometimes they're at eight o'clock at night. That's the other time that can work. Um, so let's talk. Oh, and also uh, when I was working on reserve at St. Teresa Point and Ashinanu Nation, the only way I connected with their youth council there was actually over Facebook Messenger. So again, cell phone, super important. Um, do you need parental permission? So we're going to get a little bit into the background and weeds. So technically, these are partners. These are people who are part of your research team. They are not participants. There is no parental permission required. Now, that being said, unless there is a good reason not to, I do always involve caregivers in the initial emails and information so they know what's going on, they know what to expect. Um, and because later on, if you need photo releases for anyone under the age of 18, they have to sign them for you. So having a relationship set up with the parents is a good idea. Um, I also ask caregivers if they want to be included on emails to their child. And believe me, that's worth it if they want it. And in my experience, parents, especially if the kids are a little bit younger, are the ones to get them to their meeting, whether it's a Zoom meeting or an in-person meeting for the first little while until they, for some, it's this is their first sort of job, anything like a job. So they don't necessarily have the skills to get that started. Some of them absolutely do. And the parents usually are the best um, the caregivers or parents are usually the best judge of that. So that's sort of how I get started. I have a list of things that I go over. I have a meeting with the parents and the youth usually at the same time before we get started and sort of go through some of the points that we're going to talk about. So on another note, ethics came up a lot. You do not need ethics approval to have partners. This is super key because usually, hopefully, you're bringing on those youth before you are even putting in your ethics application. So they're partners. You're asking them to do a job, an advisory role. They're part of that research team. So ethics is not required to bring them on as part of the research team. Now, that being said, there's certainly best practices. There's certainly lots of things to think about in terms of that. But ethics is not a requirement for having youth partners. Now, there are some exceptions. If you want to research the research process and, you know, have a, have a, you know, produce an article about how you engage the youth and things like that, that can get a little more complicated. Um, and also, if your youth advisory is coming from your participant group, that also gets a little tricky. But really, there are two different roles. They are signing a consent form for their data blood, pee, questionnaires, whatever, to be shared or to be part of the study. And that data is never going to be linked to them personally as a partner in their other role. So it's really two different roles that they're taking on. But you do need to be very, very clear to both parents and the youth themselves that being a partner in research is a public position. Now, that doesn't mean they're they're you know, if they don't want their image splashed all over social media, that doesn't have to happen. But if people really want to find out, chances are their names are going to be on grant applications. There might be on articles that get produced. They might be on a thank you slide in a presentation. So if somebody really wants to find out, they can. So it's really important to make sure they know that, that their name might be out there. So if you're running a disease-specific study, that means that people will know that they're involved somehow in that disease. So that's just something to be super clear up, up front so that if anyone doesn't want that to happen, then you know maybe being a partner isn't the best or how can you partner with them with them in a way that maybe they're giving input but not in any sort of public way. So that is a super important thing to talk about it. Um, and if you do want to wade into the sort of wheat field of researching the research process a bit, maybe just contact me and we can go into that in a different way, because um, it is still possible. But what you want to avoid is having, you know, to have every research email, every, every email you send out to the research team having to go through ethics doesn't work very well. So there's ways to sort of work with that. Next, you need to figure out your institutional rules and processes. So I think I have a flag at the U of M accounting department because once my cash uh, advanced reconciliation landed in the inbox of someone new and they started asking all the questions and there, whoever was supervising them just sent an email saying, no, this is Carrie, don't worry. She's always doing weird things, just pass it on to me. 
much more politely, but that was the gist of it. So I will, so you have a budget so you can pay them, right? That's the idea. So, but what are the roadblocks you might face? So for my youth advisory, I actually e-transfer them. I know that isn't always possible in every institution, um, but I will tell you that one of the advisories I work on was having a lot of trouble keeping people, was not the RACI <laughs> and Christabel's group, um, was having a real trouble keeping people. And we started uh, having meetings and then e-transferring shortly afterwards. And we now have 21 active members and of whom at, there's usually between 11 and 16 who show up and every single one of them lets me know if they can't come. So there's just a lot more back and forth. So I don't ever end up in a meeting and I don't know who's gonna be there. And that all started with the direct sort of relationship to compensating and e-transferring shortly afterwards. And sometimes it's about the money, but it's also about that relatively immediate acknowledgement of their time and effort. And it's just super helpful in getting people to show up the next time. So who do you need on board in your institution? So you need to figure out accounting. Um, how do you code it? Um, what you want to avoid is to have that sort of through purchasing, which means that the, per the, the youth themselves have to invoice. And usually that means they have to sign an agreement. And this does happen at some institutions saying that they have $2 million of liability insurance. Because if you are a contractor working for the university, that is what's required. So that's not an option for a youth you're meeting with once every three or four months, you know, or two months. So really making sure that you have those processes in place. So even though we use an hourly amount to estimate how much we pay for accounting purposes, it is still honorariums because we're not sort of filling in timesheets or anything like that. Transportation. So this is for in-person, not uh, all youth feel safe on public transport or in a cab by themselves. So really making sure that you ensure the safety and that people have a safe way getting to get to and from your meetings. Sometimes parents are absolutely willing to drop them off and that's great, but I have more than once gone and picked up several youth to get them to the meeting, all with parental permission, and then drop them off on my way home. Uh, food, I won't get into that. I feel like youth, food, that's pretty important. But do if you're especially with young kids, do think about allergies, because if they're quite little and might just grab something, you want to be super careful about that. Safety. Do all the staff working with children in person or online have vulnerable, uh, vulnerable police checks? So it's vulnerable sector police checks. And in Manitoba, we have the child abuse registry checks. If they are working with kids, they should have both. So that is super important to know um, anybody who's sort of in, uh, directly interacting with your youth or anyone under the age of 18. If they're over the age of 18, you should usually have your, uh, there is an adult uh, registry check as well. Do make sure you have an emergency contact number to call just in case you ever need it. Even if you're in virtual meetings mostly, it's just important to have that extra number. Okay. And then taxes. <laughs> All right, this is money. You are paying them for a job, okay? So yes, it is considered income, even though likely it will not affect them in any way because many youth are not making enough income for the, or you're not paying them enough uh, for it to really make a difference. But really just from the CRA point of view, that's the Canadian Revenue Agency, this is income and should be claimed on your taxes. Now, that being said, University of Manitoba doesn't require a SIN number until a person makes over $250 in a calendar year. Now, at, when I work with the hospital, they require a SIN number to pay anybody anything. So it really depends on the institution you're working in, how that works. Um, it, both of those institutions, however, a T4A, so that's the tax form that is used for sort of independent contractor work, the T4A is not issued unless that person makes over $500. So that's sort of the threshold, but really you do need to be clear that if you're paying a young person, it can affect any benefits that are going to the child. So if they're on disability benefits or anything like that, or their family, so assisted housing, disability benefits, the Canada Child Benefits, there can be effects. So just really be aware of those. Again, normally you're not paying in large enough amounts to, for that to be really an issue, but you do need to let people know and really 
help them if this might be an issue. I've thrown up the website right here. Um, these this is a wonderful group of people who will help you navigate those questions if you have them. Um, so if you have any questions about how it might affect uh, a, a family, especially if there's sort of any of those benefits involved, you can reach out to them and they can help you. Okay, Christabel, I'm done talking. Back to you. So how you approach is very important. Um, so just a note, um, this video has no audio. So doctors and researchers need to ask the right questions. So how do we do this? This leads to my next point, um, so the right seats. Separate your youth from adults. You don't really feel comfortable talking about your opinions in front of their caregivers or their parents. Start simple, maybe introduce the research. What is it about? Don't have judgment built in, no right or wrong answers. For example, don't be like, hey, what you said is wrong. This really shuts down the, child, the youth's confidence. Have examples ready. I know many of you have amazing stories. Share some, share some of the stories with the youth and children. Not looking for argument, be open-minded. Always, there's always gonna be someone who disagrees. Just be open-minded about that. Next point, um, start off well. Plan to leave more sensitive questions for later in the meeting. Ask permission to call on people, but they can pass. For example, I am an introvert. If you, I have so many great ideas. If you don't ask for my opinion, I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna say it. Start with the question everyone can answer, and that leads to my next point. If you could visit the past or the future for one week, which would you choose and why? And my all-time favorite: If you were to have a superpower, what would it be and why? Um. So um, just I'll pass on to Kay to just talk about the engaging children. All right, so let's talk about engaging them really young. What if your studies for five-year-olds or something like that? This is Jack. Hi, my name is Marilyn. Hey, Jack. So I play on gray wolves. So I play on hockey, number four gray wolves. And then I am number four and then I'm six years old today. Good job. So if anybody missed that, this is Jack. He is plays on Gray Wolves hockey. He is number four and is six years old. Okay. So, and the reason we were talking about hockey is because oftentimes when I'm working with really young children, I ask them to bring something with them something that they want to talk about. And in this case, he brought a little hockey figure. So we were talking about hockey. And then I bring a toy and I do the same things. Now, my toy might be a puppet, you know, I have some of those, or it might be um, something from the study. Like, for example, if you're going to use the blood pressure machine, you can bring that as your sort of toy and talk about how you like how it squeezes your arm, but it feels weird and things like that. So really starting to think about how you can make that work, how you can make your study, and this can be used for both participating and for partnering, if you have young participants or partnering, how do you make it sort of into a game? If you have kids that are a little bit quiet, yes, no, pop signs on popsicle sticks, or maybe, or I don't know, all these signs on popsicle sticks can be really fun. So they just answer by like, putting up popsicle sticks, that can be really fun. Or you, if you have a group of kids, uh, you put a yes sign on one side of the room and a no sign on another and a maybe sign in the middle. And then basically you ask questions and they run to the side of the room, right? So they run, all run to yes, or they all run to no, or some run to yes, some don't run to no. And always start these things off with questions like, you know, do you like chocolate or ice cream or something that really, you know, is easy to answer. And then you can slowly get harder and harder into the research questions. Have jumping and stretch breaks. I need them too. So <laughs> I do that. But, but with younger children, it's super important. If you notice that they're getting squirrely, like get up, be a bunny for a little while and then come back. 
Um, if you just need to, them to have an activity, sometimes it's just good for them to have something to sort of concentrate on while you're talking with them. Um, cotton balls or Cheerios with chopsticks, depending on their age and stage, like if you're trying to get them to move it from one container to the other, that's just a really fun sort of thing they can be doing with their hands while you're chatting with them about whatever you need to talk to them about. And of course, my favorite is puppets, but that's because I love puppets. So um, you can always find different ways to make things a little bit funner. Let's talk a little bit about compensating a kid. Because <laughs> I did, Jack got compensation. He helped with a cast clinic quality improvement study. Um, so he was helping us build a film and talk about how, what really scared him when he went to got, get his cast off. Um, so they might not have a SIN number, but whenever possible, I still want to compensate the person who's doing the work in this case, the child. So off, in this case, uh, his, his parents, we talked and they said, oh, this is his favorite store. So we got him a gift card for that, his favorite store. I did also compensate the parents who had to be there, the, well, one of the parents who had to be there the entire time with Jack. So really thinking about, are you also taking up the parents' time? Um, and, and what does that mean? And do you need to compensate them? Again, this was more of a partnership project. I know that's much more complicated in a participation role, um, but just things to think about in a partnership. Um, and uh, gift cards are considered income by the university and Canada Revenue Agency. So this is super important. If you're going, well, I can offer gift cards or offer income, um, understand that if you're giving somebody $250 worth of gift cards over the course of a year, they still will require a SIN number, a social insurance number. So that's super important to know. Um, so usually, again, you're probably not going to be compensating a five-year-old that much, but <laughs> over the course of a year, but just really to think about it, even if you're doing it in, in with the youth, really thinking about that. All right, Cristobal, I'm going to pass it back to you. So introducing yourself as a researcher, beware of the power of imbalance. For example, when you introduce yourself, don't be like, hi, my name is Cristobal. I have a bachelor's degree in science and a master's degree and a PhD. That makes the youth feel a bit um, on the low side. Um, instead, do this. Hi, my name is Christabel. This is the research I am doing. Um, my favorite thing to do when I am not working is to play soccer. That really helps in engaging the youth and children. Share your passion. Start by sharing what inspired you to become a researcher and what you love about your field. Explain your research in simple terms. In simple terms, explain what you are researching and why it is important. Use analogies, examples that the youths can relate to. Highlight the impact. Explain how your research will make a difference in people's lives. Show them your work. You can bring posters, um, you can bring posters, research paper, research work. Because for example, I thought research was all about being in a lab, putting a bunch of chemicals together, and that's what we call research. I didn't even know a survey was considered research. So just doing that makes them get a bit of an idea of what a research is. Encourage questions. I encourage the youth to ask, to ask questions about your research, your field, or your career. Um, so this uh, is a video by Elise, which you can just play it. Maybe if they're not like uh, super serious about the whole thing from the beginning, because when everything gets super serious, I get pretty nervous and then I don't get confused about what they're asking, what they're talking about. So it's like, oh, answer that question. Um, I would, but I honestly can't remember what the question was because I'm freaking out over here about how this is a very super serious meeting and these answers need to be quite serious. So oh, don't be too serious. It's intimidating. Next point. So meeting flow. How long before a question or interaction? I'll say don't go all the way and just talk about your research because it gets boring. Youth and children get bored really fast, but you can start with an icebreaker question. Avoid too many words. Don't have too many words because it's overwhelming to the youth and children. Make the info relatable with examples. Like I said, use analogies, bring up your own life stories. If it's more relatable, they are more um, more engaged and it makes them to um, talk more about the opinions and ideas they might have for the research. Different things and activities throughout the meeting, 
try and have variety of activities throughout your meeting. You can have like what we did a Mentimeter. You can have oh, what um um Carrie said. Um, bring your a favorite toy and talk about how you got it. What the name? Um, what does this toy mean to you? Listen, really listen to what the youth and children have to say. Smaller groups can also help putting them into breakout rooms or breakout groups then after having a discussion on what they talked about in their groups. I'll pass it on to Carrie. Okay, don't kill the growth. There is nothing that stops conversation in a group of youth more than shutting someone down, even if it's politely, even if you don't know that you're doing it. Sometimes we do it automatically. And there is absolutely no harm in considering, even if your initial reaction is no. When researchers first come to any patient group, I let them know this is a diversity of voices, thoughts, and ideas. Not all are going to work for your project. And you do not have to make every change based on every piece of feedback that patients give. Just like in a group of researchers, they may be some be feedback that for whatever reason don't doesn't work. And I know as a patient partner, there's sometimes I've given feedback and then later on go, that was terrible feedback. <laughs> so it's it's okay not to don't say no in that moment. So very concrete example. I was chatting with a group of youth about their experiences in the health system. And one youth brought up, well, I don't want my doctor to talk about my weight. They just shouldn't bring up my weight at all. I made a note and we continued on with the discussion about you know, their experiences in the healthcare system. A bit later on, I asked the whole group if they thought that weight could ever be a health issue. And they all agreed that, yes, it could be a health issue. So then we got onto the topic, okay, but how, so how can a healthcare professional bring it up? So we had a great discussion about how they could bring up touchy subjects in a way that felt non-judgmental and inclusive and wouldn't get that defensive reaction from the youth. And the youth who originally brought up the problem was actively took part in that discussion. But part of that's because I didn't say, well, right away, well, a doctor has to because it's a health, it could be a health problem, right? It's about giving it time, not making it personal, and really thinking about how to ask the questions. On another project we were working on, we were having a discussion in our youth group um, and the youth felt really strongly about something. And the researcher just said, well, ethics wouldn't allow me to do that. And that may be true, but instead, if you ask questions, you can often find out what they're trying to fix and why they're trying to fix that. And, and you might actually end up finding a way to implement some part of that suggestion in some way, even though it might not be the initial idea. And ultimately, if you can't implement the idea, that is also okay. You can take it away, think about it, consider it, then come back and explain why you can't. The youth aren't in this to be right, but they are in it to be heard. They are absolutely used to the dynamic of getting talked at. They know how to be a passive audience. And if you want their genuine input into your project, you have to change that dynamic. And that dynamic means don't say no, don't justify, don't shut the conversation down, even if later on you can't do it. This is Al. I asked the group about what they wanted researchers to know, and this was one of the best responses. Something I would love to tell researchers who want to get started or are just getting started in uh, talking to youth about research is that just be patient and understanding. As kids, we don't know a lot about research. I thought it was just some scientists in a faraway building just writing down things all day, and I've come to find out that might not be the case all the time. So I think just being understanding that we don't really know what we're doing is really helpful. So remember, be patient with your youth partners, but also be patient with yourself. We are all learning how to do this. There are some guidelines. This presentation hopefully will give you some things to think about, but there's no right way to do this. There are many wrong ways, but there's also no one right way. That means I've got this. We're fine. All right, harvesting the fruit. So you had your meeting, it went well, you got the information you wanted, everybody was engaged, it was great. After the meeting, just as important. So 
pay them within two weeks. We talked about this a little, a little bit earlier, but really that's super important to get that payment as quickly as you can. And if you can't just be super honest about it, but also you need to follow up because I have found that sometimes it just gets forgotten or missed. Let them know what they changed. They really want to know what their feedback did. That's really interesting. And that also shows them that you heard them. Evaluate how the meeting went and how you can improve the next time. Because each group of youth is going to be different. Really thinking about it, what worked, what didn't? When did they stop responding? Do you know why they stopped responding? Was there a moment when a bunch of people went off camera or had to run, get a drink or whatever? Maybe a break should have been called then. So each group of youth is a bit different. So evaluating each group, each meeting just helps you prepare for the next one. And reach out for feedback from the researcher but also from the group. So you want to actually do either one-on-one -on -one or group sort of going, how's it all going? Do we feel like, is there anything we can do to improve? Be really open about the fact that you are learning and will make mistakes. Be open to that feedback and give them options for you to give feedback. So, and I always give them an option that can be anonymous. So if they don't want to like call me out right in front of the group, they can go through this person here, send an email and they'll, I'll get that information, but they will, I won't know who it's from. So being really open to those, that will also make the youth themselves more open to learning and being more comfortable talking and making mistakes. Since honestly, we're all in this together. We're going to make mistakes together and that's okay. We need this to all be okay. And just one other note, always have mental health and crisis resources on hand, especially if we're talking about healthcare. Um, it's just always a good practice to have some on hand specific for youth if you're working with youth or youth and adults if you have a mix. I'll pass it back to Christabel. So well, here's part two of Eva's video. Hi, it's Emma again. So normally you should keep youth and parents separate as a rule, but there can be some exceptions like when a parent is a translator or support person, but try and avoid youth and their own parents on the same research project. Other parents are fine, but when it's the youth and their own parents, it gets a little bit awkward. Never ask the parents what the youth thinks or ask the youth to contradict their own parents or other adults. Give feedback to the youth about the changes they made and are making in the project so we know we're heard. Summarizing information, including the youth's suggestions, is always important of what you heard at a meeting. And sometimes ask the youth first, because the parent often takes up a lot of space in the meeting unless the youth is given the opportunity to speak. So in summary, always get a feedback from the youth and children who are in the research. This could help you incorporate their feedback into your next research. And also think about things you did really good on during the research and things you can improve on. So thank you everyone for listening to our presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you both so much. And to the, the racy youth, that was fantastic. I feel like so much of the advice and perspectives you shared aren't just applicable to youth. Like this is, <laughs> I mean, I, I would love to implement some of these even when we work with other adults, right? <laughs> just to make things more interesting and fun. Um, I do have one question from the chat and others uh, feel free to raise your hand or unmute or go into the chat if you wanna ask a question. Um, but oh, guys wondering um, in Manitoba, she says, all young people ages 13 to 15 must complete worker readiness certificate course that is signed by a parent guardian. Do they need this uh, when engaging as, in research as partners? It's a great question. I actually just found out about this when my 15-year-old tried to get a job. <laughs> I didn't know. They're not employees. Um, so no, I don't believe so because this is not an ongoing sort of employee situation. Um, so it's it is a bit of a gray area if you were hiring someone on as an employee yes absolutely and there are rules around the institution as well so everyone in the in in the institution needs to have uh record checks and things like that uh, so it's complicated but thus far it does not seem to be a problem again partly because it's such little money they're not employees most of the time, SIN numbers are not even involved. 
because, um, because it's such small amounts of money. Fantastic. We have quite a few people saying, well done. Thank you. Excellent. Um, someone saying, uh, incredible presentation. All the youth voices were so fantastic, especially yours, Christabel. So that's a shout out to you. Um, Chelsea says, thank you for this excellent presentation. Do you have any advice on how to navigate the ability to engage youth within the boundaries of a university or in government in Newfoundland? Every time um, she has explored engaging youth, she's encountered roadblocks in engaging people under 18. Ah, interesting. Okay, because here uh, it's actually a very high priority. Um, so I'm interested that you would find it. Now, if you need examples, like there's lots of national examples of youth advisory groups. Sometimes the issue for government is paying youth, um, which is tricky, um, which is trickier, but I. That is really interesting that Chelsea, do you want to ex expand? <laughs> so it's been maybe things have changed. It's been a little uh, while since I've attempted this. I, I work with for one of the other um, sports support units currently, but even in the past in positions within government and things like that, basically, I've just been told that it's not ethically possible to do this, even though you're right. I know what you mean in terms of, uh, you know, you don't need a, an ethics requirement because it's partnership and engagement rather than research. Um, so the issue might have been around paying, but yeah, I just wondered if, um, you know, you had any advice when in, well, maybe approaching like HR departments or anything to start the conversation with them to explain, you know, why this is important and ways around, I guess, their trepidation uh, from an ethical standpoint. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is I, I do get parental permission and part of that is to do that is to cover all of the bases. Now, healthcare usually says by 16, you do no longer need parental um, permission. But anytime I've tried to engage youth, I always do get parental permission um, and engage them in the first part of the process of sort of bringing them on just to make sure, again, you know what's going on and what are the dynamics of the family. And also, again, if you're going to need photo release forms, um, but you can certainly get the parents to sign. I have I know there are some youth groups that I sort of have dropped into where they have the parents sign a permission form to say, yes, they I agree that they're allowed to do this and that this person can contact me about their role here. So that is absolutely possible. And sometimes that will get you around that. And again, like I said, I copy all parents on all, uh, if they request it on all emails I send, which can also be helpful if you just say that's the practice. Now, I don't talk about text messages in any of those because text messages is actually usually where I'm getting most of the feedback and the, they're more, more comfortable there. Um, so parents don't get copied on those, but I've never had a request from a parent to be copied on those because I don't know if they want 17 reminders for an email for a meeting coming up. Um, but if ever a parent asked, I absolutely would copy them, just make a group chat and all three of us would be on it you know, so that they could see what I'm doing. I also have a work phone. I mean, I have a work cell phone. So if anyone ever wants to, they can see every interaction I've ever had um, with the young person. So that also is super helpful just in terms of it's not me personally, but it's, uh, it's a work device that they contact. I mean, they know it's me at the other end, but still it's that thing of like, it's there and anybody can open this device and see what, exactly what I'm talking about with the youth and what I'm doing and, and things like that. So does that help, Chelsea? It does. Thank you so much, Harriet. And Christabel, it's an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. I have more questions rolling in. Um, Amani asks, do you engage youth in all research stages, for example, design and setting priorities? Christabel, do you want to talk about what you've been engaged in so far? And then I'll jump in. Yeah. Um, so I know with RACI, we designed a poster. So that's the design aspect of it. Um, also with my ProKid research, I was involved in discussing um, the ProKid 2. And uh, um, the researchers did ask for my opinion. And I did give um, some of my opinion. And what are the barriers that will come, some of like the negative barriers that will come if the um, um, two is um, introduced and how we can prevent those barriers. So that's like how I, um, sorry, that's how I 
it sounds like my research, that's how I, um, I was engaged. Absolutely. So in that, that was actually, uh, so it was an implementation science project for those of you who aren't familiar with ProKid. Um, and it was basically assessing the barriers and facilitators. So this was sort of trying to figure out how, how to get this tool into, into practice. Um, but yes, the, yes, you would engage them in all of them would be ideal. Um, I know in eye care, it didn't start out that way. The first five years was sort of researcher driven, but as soon as the patient advisory and the youth came on, they started to change the project and make it work for them. So the first five years happened, but then the youth came on and said, mental health, you got to look at mental health. If you're not looking at mental health, you are not seeing the picture. And so they started looking at mental health and they figured out with the youth what questionnaires they were going to use to assess mental health. And then they put that into the research study. And then five years later, they proved, they have data to now prove that mental health has, uh, through uh, full system inflammation, affects mental health or affects kidney, whether, uh, whether uh, the kids with type 2 diabetes have uh, problems with their kidneys. So it's sort of like, now the data shows that we have that data. And now we're trying to figure out which type of intervention, mental health intervention is going to be best. So and that the, the things that we're trying are also suggested by the youth. So it's sort of like, yes, they can be involved in everything. And that's why ethics, you can't get ethics if you're involving them in those early stages because ethics won't know what to do with your application. They'll actually probably send it back to you going, I don't know what to do with this um, because you haven't set, you don't have your study yet. You're just actually involving them to get your study started. That is absolutely ideal. Yeah, like pre-protocol, right? So what are you supposed yeah. to submit? Um, I'm curious, kind of somewhat related, in considering that a lot of research takes a long time and there can be like long breaks between activities, especially ones that are engaging patient and public partners and youth. Um, and this one's for Christabel. What, like, I'm sure this has happened to you. How do you kind of stay involved? Like what makes you stay interested or come back to the research after there's a long break? Um, one thing um, is after, even after the, I'll just give an example with the pro kid research. Um, even after it was, um, it's been a while, they um, sent out an email asking for um, our feedback on a poster they made. Um, so what we could change, um, what some things they could add. So just asking for our feedback, even after um, the research is on like kind of on a, on a break is really helpful to engage the youth. Um, also, um, for um, Racy, I know um, we we go, um, we, we have a break, but also it's always engaging because after that, like, oh, so what did you do um, during, um, I, we haven't seen you in a while, what did you do? So we all talk about what we've done and then we just get into it. It's really, um, there are just so many different ways you can keep the youth engaged uh, in regards to having like a long break. It sounds like not just telling them, here's what we've been up to, but also like, what have you been up to? What's happened in your life? Yeah, that's a great point. And like, and you can do things like if you don't have a full meeting's worth of stuff, that's okay. Like we built spaghetti and marshmallow towers and that was the most fun we'd had in a long time. Right? Like, it's like, you can you get also- paid to do that? <laughs> that's, that's amazing. <laughs> I mean, we did a lot of work that meeting, but then we were like, okay, and now comes the competition part. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, uh, so thinking about, you know, and updates, like the eye care kids ask me, I send them monthly email updates. I don't know how many of them actually read them. I don't know if it matters, but they get every month, they get something from me. Just saying, he, here's what's going on. Mm -hmm. Even if it's three lines. Um, Probably better than a full page newsletter anyway. <laughs> yeah, we talk a lot about how much information that is something uh, so terms of reference, we usually use guiding principles and try and keep it to a page, maybe two pages, but keep it super simple and create it with the youth um, mm -hmm. themselves. What's important for them to feel safe in the room is way more important in a lot of the ways than your what your institution needs in there. So um, that's just something else to flag. We do have a couple questions, and I'm I'm not surprised because this always comes up. Uh, E-transfers. How are you doing this? Is the question. <laughs> okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Took us a while to figure it out, but we did, and they allow us to do it. So you get a cash advance. Now, for my RAC and RACI members, uh, so that's my parents and my youth, 
I just do it through my personal account and that's okay because it's always to the same group. However, like I care, they always have cash advances going on. So what has happened is the investigator has gone and set up a bank account, personal bank account in their own name, gotten two bank cards and any cash advance that comes out gets deposited into that bank account. One card the investigator keeps, the other card goes to the coordinator and then the coordinator e-transfers out of that account that has just cash advances from that particular study to all the different people. So to the 21 different people that we pay. So that's how, how they've set it up. So um, yeah, and there's a couple of different studies that have set that up that basically, so the, the investigator gets the cash advance, they okay. deposit it directly into the, the eye care account. Because usually on your phone, you can choose what account do you want to deposit this, you know, or they get a check and they just deposit it into the, or, you know, depends on whether you get direct deposit or a check, but they get, if they get direct deposit, they just get the deposit, then they put it into the eye care. They transferred over to the, in this case, it's the eye care bank account that's still under their name. And then the coordinator has access to that. So they can go get cash if it's a meeting in person and you're going to get people to sign, or they can e-transfer okay. out of it to those, to each person. So those are the two ways uh, that it works. And then in that case, um, the coordinator would, do they still have to get signatures? Even if it was done by e-transfer, they have to get some kind of signature and send that into ethics? Is that okay, what is there, they have to is do? Is there anyone from accounting here? <laughs> Okay. I don't know why so, I'm so interested because no, it's, it's, it it's okay. A roadblock. It's it is. It really is of paying people quickly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah. what I will say is that in the eye care and next gen research studies, they just have the page from the bank saying that it was accepted, and that's what they put in. I have now been asked. I have to do that and get an email or text confirmation from the person themselves and put in both. So don't offer to put in both. I don't know why I need to. Whoever's desk it fell on the first time I had to do this, or maybe because I was the first person to do it, there was sort of more things involved. But uh, most of the time on the study side, it seems to be just, you just need the bank page, but you need it after, like after it's been accepted, if that makes sense. Because you can send an e-transfer and cancel it, right? So you have to have the, the page after it's been accepted, not just the page where it's sent. And actually now I know my bank sends me an email saying your bank, it's been confirmed to be accepted. So worst comes worse, you could probably put those two things in if, if you can't get the person to text you back, which has happened. Perfect. You're, you're both have been a wealth of knowledge. Um, and like I said, not just for engaging youth, but engaging in general, some really good ideas, tips, and some practical actions that we can all take when we're working together. Um, yeah, if folks could complete the evaluation, that would be fantastic. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Uh, you've both done a wonderful job and we really appreciate you joining us. Um, yeah, and hopefully folks can join us for our next session. That'll be on June 14th, uh, where we'll have some members from uh, CHI's Collaborative Partnership come and talk about um, why they're interested in doing engagement and what that means in terms of inclusiveness and kind of what they're looking forward to in the future of patient engagement. So always a good session to have the panelists. Um, yes, thank you, Christabel. Thank you, Carrie. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I'll send out an email follow up with all the information you're desiring from this presentation, including a link to the recording. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye.